recording. Yeah, let me go. Okay. All right, so Jen, thanks again for that nice introduction. Um, I do so many things over the years. I don't even know when that was from, where you got that blurb <laughs> from about 10 or 15 years ago. Because things change and that sort of thing. But so I'm Adam Brusky. Many of you know me. I see some of my own patients on the, on the line. I'm a professor here at the University of Pittsburgh and co-director of the Comprehensive Breast Cancer Center. I started the Women's Cancer Center at McGee in 1998. Uh, and so I've been here really 26, 27 years already. And it's really kind of surprising uh, how far it's grown. And it's just really exciting. And I've done this talk a number of times. And you may see some things that are familiar, um, hopefully some things that are new. Um, and some of the things I'm going to present are fairly sophisticated. You know, I don't feel like you have to comprehend the entire graph or whatever as I go through it. I'll try to go slower when I get to it. And I think the best part of this whole kind of thing is, you know, afterwards, maybe I'll talk for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then the, the, the best part of these sort of talk uh, presentations is really taking your questions and your concerns. And that's always, I think, the most um, uh, uh, satisfying and gratifying thing for everybody. So don't feel, you know, bashful. Ask questions in the in the chat initially uh, for a variety of reasons. I think um, uh, the Cancer Caring Center doesn't want actual people to be recorded. So once we turn it off, as Jen had said, um, we will be able to kind of actually have a more free willing conversation and maybe answer the questions there too. So with that, let me get started here. Let's see if I have control of this. Yeah, there we go. Um, so in two, 2022, there'll be about 280 uh, thousand cases of invasive breast cancer and about 50,000 cases of ductal carcinoma in situ. And just to kind of, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but ductal carcinoma in situ isn't really cancer. It's a precursor of cancer that can become cancer over time. Uh, and about 43, 44,000 women will die of breast cancer this year. It's the most common cancer in women in the United States. Uh, in the U.S., every two minutes, one case of breast cancer is diagnosed. Uh, however, um, there has been um, a substantial decline, that's not 1%, it's a 10% decline in breast cancer deaths. And as a result, there's a number of women still alive doing very, very well with stage four metastatic breast cancer. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, just to kind of give you an overview of my thoughts about this, having done this now for almost 27, 28 years. Um, and there are two things that we try to do. If you have early stage breast cancer, we try to make sure it never comes back with as minimal toxicity to you as possible. I mean, that's kind of really where we're going. I think that I think as we're going to talk about it a little bit, you know, we have all sorts of new drugs that are less toxic than chemo and, and new ways of figuring out who needs chemo and who doesn't. And so we have that. But if, you know, you get metastatic breast cancer, um, we're really trying to turn it, and I think we have in many cases, starts to really turn this into a chronic disease you can live with. Um, and again, the whole idea it's not only to turn into a chronic disease like you know hypertension or diabetes or something like that, but actually do it in a way that you maintain your quality of life. And again, with a minimum amount of effective therapy. And I think that's kind of where we're going. And it's been really gratifying in my career to kind of see us begin to see the horizon on this. And again, we could talk more about this in the question and answer session. Um, you always hear this one in eight figure. And in fact, I gave an interview for some TV station a few days ago. And they said one in eight people get breast cancer a year. No, one in eight people will get breast cancer ever in their lifetime. And uh, obviously it's rare when you're in your 20s and 30s. Um, you, know, by, you know, by age 30, it's one in 2000. Um, by age 50, it's one in 50. Uh, by age 70, it's one in 14. By age 85, it's one in nine. So everybody, you know, so you have about a one in eight chance of getting breast cancer during your life. And I think the vast majority of the cancers that are diagnosed though, are fairly um, low stage, low grade tumors uh, that are curable. Let's see, let me go to this. And these are the risk factors. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff when we can again talk about this. You know, is, does eating chicken cause breast cancer? Does eating high fat cause breast cancer? Does, you know, not exercising cause breast cancer? It's really hard to know. I mean, I think that clearly, obviously, women get breast cancer. Um, it's a disease of age. The older you are, as we said before, the more likely you're gonna get breast cancer. There are genetic components. Um, there are mutations in BRCA1 or 2. There are some other genes here, PALB2, ATAM, TP53, CHECK2. And that's something actually that's fairly uh, new in the last five or six years. We don't only do BRCA1 and 2 genes I think everybody's familiar with, but we do about another 25 genes. And it's all about 200 bucks. You know, so it's really become very inexpensive or relatively inexpensive to do this testing. And everybody can get tested now if they want. 
Um, you know, you can get a hard, you know, insurers will give you a hard time, but it's not that expensive. A lot of people will get it done. There's color, which is like 99 bucks. There's a lot of ways that people can do this on their own if they so desire. The problem is really, if you have a mutation, what do you do about it? That's where you really need to have a genetic counselor or an oncologist or someone talk to you about it. And I think what's also interesting is that just to kind of talk a little bit about gene structure, I know this is kind of complicated, but, you know, genes um, have the areas that make protein, right? So the whole idea behind a gene is that it'll make a protein and it codes for an RNA that it makes a protein in your body. And most of the mutations right now that cause problems in some of these family genes really are in the protein, what we call the protein coding region of the gene. But it turns out there's all of these other mutations that are in other areas um, of the non-protein coding areas that probably are going to be important. And I think that, you know, you have these families sometimes where like the whole family has breast cancer, like the moms have it, the sister has it, you know, maybe the daughter may have it. And you don't find a gene. And I suspect it's going to be one of these more subtle genes at the end of the day. Alcohol may increase risk. I think one drink a day, I don't necessarily believe that seven to 10%. And we just put the slide together, but I think that, you know, clearly if you're drinking a six pack a day, it probably doesn't, it's no good for you. And, you know, obviously anything in moderation is what most docs tell you. I think obesity probably has something to do with it, especially after menopause and low physical activity that we're going to talk about kind of at the end. Um, it's interesting, there's, there's quite a lot of kind of controversy right now about hormone exposure. There's been controversy for 10 or 15 years already um, that prolonged estrogen exposure is a risk factor for developing breast cancer. And I think that we know women uh, who have an early menarche, start their periods early and have a late menopause, um, have a slightly higher risk of um, breast cancer. I think women who get a bilateral oophorectomy before age 40, that's get their ovaries out. Um, that reduces their lifetime risk of breast cancer by 50 to 60%. I think women who have pregnancies later um, actually have an increased risk of breast cancer. And the reason for that is that when you get pregnant, you have a lot of progesterone, which is a protective hormone, uh, and less estrogen, which is really the hormone that causes problems. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, to be honest with you, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's still very complicated, and it hasn't been sorted out entirely. Um, and you know, that's shown here. I mean, there's this whole thing of hormone replacement therapy. And, you know, this is from a study called the Women's Health Study, where 160,000 women uh, were studied over a 20, 30 year period. Uh, and it turned out that um, hormone replacement therapy didn't result in an increased risk of breast cancer. But um, it's only when you have a combined estrogen and progesterone um, tablet. I mean, a lot of these, as a lot of you know, uh, have the progesterone to prevent uterine cancer or prevent uterine bleeding. Um, but if you had estrogen alone, it was actually protective, believe it or not, as you can see there, this hazard ratio means, you know, that hazard ratio of 0.77 means it's a 32% reduction uh, in the risk of breast cancer, but it increases endometrial cancer. So, you know, I think that um, uh, it's really controversial. I think if women have had a hysterectomy for whatever reason, I think estrogen only hormone replacement therapy is fine. Um, there's a slightly higher risk of blood clots and hormones that uh, replacement therapy. But I think estrogen alone um, uh, really is, in some cases, protective. Um, and again, it's really interesting. It's still under a lot of debate. It hasn't really been talked a lot. You know, I mean, I think the pandemic hit and all of this other stuff, uh, epidemiologic stuff, went by the boards for a few years. So breast cancer kind of develops over time. And there's a sequence of mutations that happen uh, when you get breast cancer. So Breast cancer comes from the ducts that carry milk uh, from the lobules. You have the lobules in the breast that make milk. You have the ducts that carry milk out uh, to the nipple and out uh, to the exterior. And so 85% of all breast cancer is in the ducts. And so you have normal ducts. And then you get a series of genetic mutations that causes introductal hyperplasia that people can see. Um, and this has a slightly higher increased risk of breast cancer. Then you have um, more hyperplasia. These cells get a little bit more disordered. Um, and then finally, you have ductal carcinoma in situ, which is still not a cancer. It's a precancer. It only becomes really a cancer when it breaks through this basement membrane, these cells of the duct that kind of hold it in place, and then it can spread through the body. And that's what we call it. I mean, there's a whole debate about whether we should call ductal and start DCIS or introductal carcinoma in situ, cancer or not. But I think that, you know, this will not spread, basically. It's really breaking through that membrane, causes the spread of the cancer elsewhere in the body. And so about 20, 25 years ago, we started looking at breast cancer genomically. And so what we're able to do, um, the human genome has 22,000 genes, and they're all expressed in cells at various levels. 
And you can measure the levels of the expression of all of those 22,000 genes at once. And so this is, a, this is one of many, many different kinds of experiments that were done where they actually did that. A group of investigators at the University of North Carolina actually did look at all 22,000 genes in a series, I think, of about 500 cases of breast cancer. And the cancers divided themselves into kind of neat little um, kind of uh, uh, packages. So there was luminal A, which is a slow-growing estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. There's luminal B, which is a fast-growing estrogen receptor positive uh, cancer. There's ERB2 overexpressing, which is HER2 positive breast cancer. There's basal breast cancer, which you consider triple negative. And this normal is kind of also a lot like the triple negatives as well. And so it's interesting in that we actually uh, have split up our therapy um, in people depending uh, on whether they're one of these three subtypes, whether they're hormone receptor positive, um, they're treated generally with hormonal therapy, sometimes chemo, um, sometimes targeted therapies that we'll talk about in a few minutes, triple negative, primarily chemo, although we're using immunotherapy now. Um, and if you have a cancer that, or, or your BRCA1 or 2, um, we give you a drug called Alaprib. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, HER2 positive is treated generally with a drug called Herceptin, um, which is um, an antibody against HER2. And there's other antibodies we're going to talk about a little bit later. But our therapies are really driven uh, by what kind of cancer uh, someone has, a woman has when she's diagnosed. Um, and we talk about staging, you know, in breast cancer, although I think in breast cancer, it's very, the stage is important to some degree, but the, but the intrinsic biology of the cancer, I think is far more important. You know, the genes that are abnormal and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, but just to talk about staging, stage one is a cancer less than two centimeters in diameter and the lymph nodes under your armpit are not involved. Stage two is a cancer between two and five centimeters um, uh, with, lymph no with or without lymph nodes involved or under five centimeters with lymph node involved. Stage three uh, is over five centimeters that involve lymph nodes or kind of invading the local structures like the underlying muscle or coming through the skin. And stage four is spread outside of the breast and lymph nodes. That's kind of how we define um, breast cancer. And again, this is historical, um, mainly because, you know, in the past when we didn't have a lot of therapies and the only therapy really was surgery, the surgeons kind of use these stages to prognosticate people. But now that we have therapies that go all throughout your body, what we call systemic therapies, it turns out that the staging, you know, is a little bit archaic. We don't use, we still stage people, but prognostically, the characteristics of the cancer, what we can do to reduce it, prevent from coming back or to treat it if it's metastatic is far more important right now than the stage. Um, and again, these are older data. You know, I think that this, the staging survival I think this is a lot higher now, believe it or not. Um, I think if you have localized breast cancer stage one or two, I'd agree that the vast majority of people are going to survive and do well. I think if it's regional involvement, I think it's this is even higher now, um, probably in the high 80s, low 90s. Uh, and stage four metastatic disease is more like 40%. Um, it's much higher. And in fact, um, again, I think estrogen receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, it's far more than five years. HER2, it's really getting to be more than five years. We're working on triple negative. Again, that's for metastatic disease. That's not for um, um, early stage disease. Um, and so, again, this is actually, um, nothing may not cure it, although I doubt that. I think with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, I think there are some things that potentially can cure it. Um, and we're really trying to turn it into a chronic disease. I mean, the first thing we try to do, obviously, make your symptoms go away. The second thing is we try to extend the amount of time before the cancer gets worse. Uh, and obviously, what we want to do in both of those, um, extend the amount of time we live with the cancer. Uh, and actually make it go away. I mean, live as great a life as you can um, with metastatic breast cancer for as long as you can. That's really the idea behind a lot of the therapies that we try to do. Um, so people who come in, it turns out just about everybody now can get a, um, a test, BRC1 or two. If you have triple negative breast cancer at any age, so if you're diagnosed less than age 45, everybody gets uh, tested. If you're less than 50 with two, uh, if you have two separate uh, tumors, either in either breast, uh, or one, either sister or mother with breast cancer under 50, or anybody in your family that has ovarian cancer, you get tested. Um, I think that, um, uh, again, if you're triple negative breast cancer at any age, if you have a man in your family with breast cancer, you have a history of breast or ovarian cancer. If you are Ashkenazi Jew um, or French Canadian, um, I think you get tested. But it turns out, to be honest with you, just about everybody uh, with triple negative breast cancer gets tested. And most women with estrogen receptor positive early stage breast cancer uh, will get tested if they meet any of these criteria. 
uh, they really have loosened up a lot. Um, and these are the genes, BRCA1 or 2. They're on different chromosomes. Um, BRCA2 has, has pancreatic cancer, male breast cancer, melanoma, and prostate cancer. So if you have a family that has pancreatic cancer, uh, stomach cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and as well as breast, we think of BRCA2. Um, and again, you have about, if you have one of these genes, you have about an 80 to 90 percent, or 50 to 80 percent chance of developing breast cancer during your lifetime. Um, a little bit less risk of ovarian cancer with BRCA2, um, and a high risk of prostate cancer, and about a 5 to 10 percent increased risk of male breast cancer with these. Now, why is this important? So, you know, we used to do screening, and we still do, and we have high risk clinics where people go. Um, but in the last five years, and in fact, this is data from actually this year, um, we now have drugs uh, that can actually treat women who have um, breast cancer that's associated with BRCA1 or 2. There is a, um, a drug, a laparid, um, that actually is what's called, classes called PARP inhibitors. And basically what it does, if you have BRCA1 or 2, your breast cancer cells cannot repair the DNA that well. And what a laparid does is it actually kind of forces the cells to try to repair the DNA. And if it can't repair the DNA, then the cells die. It's called synthetic lethality is what we call it. And it turns out that there's a trial called Olympia that was done that took women uh, who had either triple negative breast cancer uh, or stage uh, two or three um, breast cancer uh, that did not have a complete response to chemotherapy given before surgery. Um, and they, then they did this particular trial with them. Let's kind of go through this. Um, if they were to get chemo for surgery, they basically had chemo for surgery, surgery, then radiotherapy. If they were adjuvant, if they had already had surgery, then they had their chemotherapy and then radiation. But afterwards, what they had, they were randomized to receive a placebo pill, a sugar pill, or a laparid for a year afterwards. And the idea here is to prevent recurrence of the breast cancer later on. That was the idea. And in triple negative breast cancer, and I'll say this multiple times, if you're cancer, and I told this to people who've come to see me know this, that if you don't have a recurrence in the first three to four years, it's not going to come back with triple negative breast cancer. You never say never, but the vast majority of distant recurrences in triple negative breast cancer in the first three years. So anyway, this is the study. Um, and this is what happened. This is the overall survival. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot. I mean, you know, it's the difference between 89% or 90% and 86%, but still it's a reduction here of about 34 deaths. Um, with the elaborate. And so this is actually saving people's lives or 30 people that are now alive um, who would not have been alive um, because they got elaborate um, instead of placebo. And so this is now the standard of care. And because this is now a drug that can affect people's survival and affect the risk of recurrence, um, we've gone from just you know having those kind of tests that we do for BRCA1 or 2 um, and we really have gone a little further and just say, it's not only for screening now, there's therapy that we can do. And Olaparib is actually used even for metastatic breast cancer. So, you know, we really are now trying to test many, many more people for BRCA1 or 2 and some of these other genes that are associated with this because we have drugs now that can influence their clinical course. And I think that's really important to know. Um, again, you know, this is just the amount of time that the patients had before the cancer, um, uh, you know, 82% of the patients that have the cancer come back at four years. We're about, uh, uh, um, so this is only about 20% versus 25%. Um, and if it doesn't come back before here, it's not going to come back. So the bottom line is that it also influenced that dramatically. Um, and again, you can see that data there. I'm just going to go through this quickly because I think I made the point. Um, I don't know why this had, this got in here. But anyway, so, I mean, because of this, um, we, you know, really are much more um, uh, inclined um, to try to understand someone's genetics when they come in, a lot more than we used to be, say, five or 10 years ago. And basically, the bottom line is that it's important to know your family history. I think that's really, really important here, that if you know your family history, um, especially if you're triple negative, if you have triple negative breast cancer, we're going to test you for BRC1 or 2, no matter how old you are. Um, if you have an ER positive breast cancer, it depends on how big the cancer is and, and other things like that. But if you have a strong family history, as I said before, we'll probably test you as well. So that I think is something that's really come out in the last year or two that's really important. And those of you who come to my clinic, we talk about this all the time. Um, and so really, um, you know, how do we evaluate drugs in oncology? This is somewhat controversial now because, you know, you have drug companies that spend a couple billion dollars trying to develop these. And, you know, and th there's a real debate now. You know, what does it mean 
you know, for a patient, especially in metastatic breast cancer, to have something that influences the course of disease. You know, is it a response? Is it shrinking the tumor? Is it having stable disease for more than six months? Um, so there's no change in the tumor. Does that help? Um, is it progression-free survival? That is how long the patient stayed in the response. I think the big one, the gold standard is overall survival, how long you live. And it's also quality of life. I think it's the combination of the two that we try to do. But the problem is that to find overall survival, it could take many, many years to do a clinical trial. And so we look for what are called surrogate endpoints, like progression-free survival, to help guide us um, a little bit to try to figure out if someone has more progression-free survival, does that matter at the end of the day? Um, does that predict for overall survival? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So we're going to talk about HER2 in breast cancer. I think a lot of people know many of this. This is developed, um, this whole field actually was developed by a guy named Dennis Slayman. He uh, was born in Newcastle, used to come back all the time. He, I think he um, almost won the Nobel Prize. Did he win the Nobel Prize? I don't know if he did or not, but this, this did win the Nobel Prize. I don't know if Dennis Slayman uh, actually won it. I think he should have. But the bottom line is that normally you have 20,000 of these HER2 receptors on your cell. About 20% of the time, the nucleus of a breast cancer cell becomes unstable. You make a lot of copies of the HER2 gene. You have a lot of copies of the HER2 protein on the cell surface that makes the, the cells kind of resistant uh, to chemotherapy and to resistant to other ways of killing them. And so we have a lot of therapies against HER2. And just to kind of go through some of these, um, and again, we can talk more about these. Um, so we have HER2 by itself and HER2 is a receptor. This is the exterior, so this is the cell membrane. So this is the outside, this is inside of the cell. This receptor goes through the cell like this, and you have drugs like trastuzumab, which is Herceptin, margituximab, which is related to Herceptin, that bind to HER2 and prevent it from kind of having a conformational change to kind of activate the cell downstream. We have a lot of things called HER2 tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They bind to this area, this phosphate internally, this type what's called a tyrosine kinase domain, and lapatinib, um, uh, neuratinib, which is Neuralynx, to catnib, which is Tuscaia that many of you have heard about, bind to this and interfere with the downstream signaling. Um, we have a drug called pertuzumab um, that binds to HER2 and blocks it from binding to another protein called HER3, and therefore HER2's effects are not as dramatic in the cell. Uh, and then we actually have a lot of really interesting things, uh, things that are called proteasome inhibitors. So basically what happens is that HER2 um, is recycled, so it goes in the cell, and these inhibitors um, kind of block, um, they, inhi they inhibit the, um, well, actually what they do is they increase the breakdown of HER2 in the cell. So you don't have as much HER2 in the cell. These didn't work that well, but we're going to talk about these at great length. These are, are what are called antibody drug conjugates. Uh, there's TDM1 and a new one. Uh, this is a Cancilla, and there's TDXD, which is in HER2. Uh, this is another one called trastuzumab, ducocarbazine, that we're not really going to talk about, but these really have changed breast cancer oncology uh, dramatically in the last six to nine months. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And so this is just kind of Herceptin. Um, what Herceptin does, um, the, the, again, the signals in the cell and the cell keeps growing. Herceptin will bind it and block uh, the downstream signaling, but it'll also recruit all these immune cells from the body's own immune defenses to kind of kill the cell as well. So it does a bunch of different things uh, together. Um, and so we have all these agents uh, that we talk, I talked briefly about. We have trastuzumab, which is an antibody against the HER2 protein. We have pergetta or pertuzumab, which is an antibody against the HER2 protein that blocks HER3. Uh, when we give chemotherapy with Herceptin and pergetta, um, the median survival, that is the amount of time 50% of women will live with this um, uh, from the time they're diagnosed with stage four disease, is actually longer than this now. It's probably about six, five years. And in fact, a third to 40% of people live eight years or longer. Now, we have a lot of other drugs. We have Neuralynx uh, and Tuscaia, um, or Tukaiza, which are HER2. Um, these are, these are uh, um, drugs that bind to that internal kind of tyrosine kinase of the HER2 receptor. Uh, their major side effects are diarrhea. Uh, we have Cancilla, which is a monoclonal antibody I'm going to talk about in a minute with a little bit of chemo bound to it. And then finally, we have in HER2, which is a monoclonal antibody against HER2 with a different kind of chemo bound to it. And let's talk about these, because I think these are really in the last year or two, uh, something that really is going to change and has changed breast cancer oncology, and it's going to continue changing it dramatically. Um, so basically, this is the old one that we had, and this was developed, you see where this is from 2008. And so this was an antibody against HER2, 
none of them that had this linker, this chemical linker, and had a molecule called DM1. And DM1 was very toxic to cancer cells and to normal cells. In fact, when they gave it to people as a single agent, their bone marrow would be suppressed. They would have low neutrophils and low platelets and low red cells. And so it was never really developed, but if you can give smaller amounts of it in DM1, it can work better. And in fact, that's what happened. There's a series of trials that took place about 10 years ago that if we gave TDM1 and compared it to the standard of care, in this case, lapatinib and Zolota, which is a standard of care for second line therapy, if you gave this, you actually had an improved survival here. You had an increased overall survival. This is a second line therapy after one therapy. This is after multiple lines of therapy that there actually was you know, again, about a five month benefit uh, in absolute terms, but a reduction in the risk of dying of about a third. If you got um, uh, this uh, um, uh, TDM1, this antibody, we call antibody drug conjugate. So, you know, this is really exciting and it became the standard of care for second line therapy, but obviously it wasn't good enough. And I think that what happened is that Daiichi Sankyo, uh, about probably nine, eight or nine, seven, eight, nine years ago, tried to improve on um, TDM1 on Kitsilla and developed in HER2. And in HER2 did a bunch of different things. The first thing it did is that one thing is you want to add more drug to the antibody. So this was three to one, three chemos to one antibody. This was eight to one. This also allowed it to have a cleavable linker. So what that meant is this had to go inside of the cells to release this. This had to go inside of the cells. The protein had to be destroyed, relieving the chemo. This could actually be released outside of the cells. You just have to bind to any HER2 on the cell and release this close to it. And so that's what's called a tumor bystander effect. So, you know, for these reasons that TDXD or in HER2 was thought to be a better drug than TDM1. And so this was a trial that was actually presented a year ago and published a number of times. And this really got everybody very, very excited. So these are women with HER2 positive breast cancer that was metastatic, that had progressed through the first line of therapy. So most people would get, say, you know, Taxol, Perceptin, a progenitor, or something like it. And then they would have disease that would grow through that, usually after a couple of years. And those people were randomized to receive either Cadcilla, the old drug, or in HER2, the new drug. And you can see here. Um, and basically, what happened in this trial is this, and you rarely see this that basically the women who got the Cadcilla only had a median of about you know, seven months before their cancer progressed. And you can see here this curve kind of started to go down. But if they got in HER2, basically they had two years before their cancer progressed if they got in HER2. And I think this really, you know, we were very, very, got, we were very, very excited, I think all of us at Breast Cancer Oncologists, when we saw this data last year, because I think it really was gonna, was gonna, is gonna change the natural history of the disease. Now, this does come with some side effects. And I think it causes a very unusual inflammation of the lungs about 10% of the time, and we have to stop the drug. And so what we tell women who are on in HER2, uh, is that if you have any cough or shortness of breath, you have to tell us. You have to. I don't care when it is. I don't care what time of day or night it is. You have to call the person on call or the next morning call us. Because stopping the drug and giving someone steroids can relieve it. But if it goes too far, it may not be reversible. So it's really important. The other thing that happens is that it causes a little bit of problems with the heart, um, a little bit of decrease in left ventricular ejection fraction, a little bit of heart failure. So these are the two things that we worry about with this. Although dramatically, uh, it's done really well. So again, the other thing is that it not only works, so these are people initially who got it, who had HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, but the guys at Daiichi had a better idea. So HER2 positive breast cancer is about probably 20% of all breast cancer, but about another 50% of breast cancer has some expression of HER2 on the cell surface. So instead of being HER2 three plus, which is positive for HER2, it's HER2 one plus or two plus. And that's another 50% of breast cancer. So they said, oh, well, this drug has this bystander effect and it can release this, you know, if it binds to any small amount of HER2, it can release its chemo and kind of, you know, maybe even with HER2 one plus, it'll work. And they actually did a, a, a small study of 54 women and actually had a response in HER2 one plus and two plus of about 37%. And about the women did well for about a year, uh, which is normally they do well for about three or four months. And so people were very excited about this. And this led to a big trial that was presented at our national meeting. You probably heard about it on the national news about probably three or four months ago. It was in June. Uh, and this trial took patients or women with HER2 low breast cancer. Uh, that is, they had HER2 that was one plus or two plus. They had metastatic breast cancer that had had one or two rounds of chemotherapy and Herceptin and whatever in the metastatic setting. 
And they, a lot of them actually had, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, a lot of them had um, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors like Ibrance or Verzania or Kisqually, and they had already gone through that. And there was 480 people who had hormones that were positive and acidic breast cancer. But interestingly enough, they added 60 patients because there are women with triple negative breast cancer who, <laughs> excuse me, even though they're triple negative, even though the cancer is triple negative, they still have some HER2 expression. Probably about 20% of HER2 positive of triple negative breast cancer or some HER2 expression on it. So they added them as well. And again, um, you know, I think the most important thing in this is a number of prior therapies. These women had a lot of therapy, at least three therapies in the metastatic setting. So these women had been through a lot by the time they got the chemo. And this just shows you that the progression-free survival was doubled. You know, that was five and a half months. It went up to 10. That means you double this hazard ratio of 0.51, double the amount of time before your cancer got worse. Um, importantly, it also increased your overall survival by at least a third. So it improved by one third the probability of you being alive two, three years later uh, with this. And so this is really something that, you know, again, it doesn't seem like a lot. It's, these curves obviously aren't at 100%. We like that. But this really, when you see these sort of results, you get very excited. And you really see the most important one, I think, is here in triple negative breast cancer. In triple negative breast cancer, it increases overall the progressive survival by double and doubled, more than double, the overall survival of triple negative breast cancer. And so for this reason now, if someone has triple negative breast cancer, they've been through a lot of different therapies, we're really searching pretty hard to try to find any HER2 staining on any prior tumor. And there's actually a new test circulating of tumor cells that we do looking for HER2 staining if there's no HER2 staining anywhere else. So we're really trying in triple negative breast cancer to identify people who could get uh, this in HER2 drug because it's dramatic. Major side effects of this drug really is nausea. That's probably the big one that women complain about. And we have to be aggressive. Low white count's another one. Um, and again, obviously, um, the um, interstitial lung disease, about 8.2% of women had to stop because of that inflammation of the lung. Um, but other than that, it was very safe here. It just shows you here that again, it was 12.1% got it, but about seven to 8% had to stop. We can, the other 4% we could retreat after a break of a couple of months. So that's kind of HER2 positive. And I think that, that this year was the most exciting thing that's happened in breast cancer uh, is, is that trial where now, you know, now 70% of women can come in and can get one of those antibody drug conjugates. Well, what about some other ones? Well, obviously, um, we have immunotherapy. And the idea behind immunotherapy is that when T cells in your body that want to kill tumor cells approach them, there's this thing called PD-1 and PD-L1. And the idea is that that serves as a break on the cell. So the cell sees the antigen, sees the thing it wants to attack. And this says, no, don't attack me. I'm, I'm you, I'm self, you know, because if we attacked our own cells, we'd have all sorts of autoimmune disease. And so the idea is to develop a monoclonal antibody that blocks this interaction and therefore revs up the T cells. That's pretty much how this works and how PD-1 inhibitors work. And so this is actually early stage breast cancer. This is a trial called Keynote 522. These are any woman uh, in this trial had triple negative breast cancer and had a breast cancer over two centimeters in diameter. And they were randomized to chemotherapy, which generally um, chemotherapy called carboplatin, paclitaxel, and a chemo called doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide with or without pembrolizumab. Um, and they did that for uh, about uh, 24 weeks, got surgery, and then got pembrolizumab after. Uh, and again, the success of this is really measured by the complete pathologic response. And what you can see here is that if you just got chemo alone, about half of the people had a complete response, a pathological response. It went up about 15%, 13.6% uh, actually, if you got pembrolizumab. And at the women who got pembrolizumab actually at 18 months and now even at about three years had about a six to 7% improvement uh, in the number of women uh, who did not have distance spread to like lungs or liver or bone or brain. And so, you know, and as I said before, you know, if you get out to two years, three years, and these curves are the same, you're not going to have a relapse. It's going to pretty much stay that way. Uh, and I think it's really, this is very exciting data. Um, and this just shows you here, if you have a complete pathological response, you know, six years, you know, three years later, you're pretty much just about, I mean, it's not everybody, unfortunately, but it's just about everybody, 94% um, uh, did really well. If you did not have a PCR, if you had residual disease, still about two thirds of women um, still did really well. Uh, if you have BRCA positive disease, these are the people that we would give the elaborate to at this point, or there's some other chemotherapies we could use to try to improve that result a little bit more. And it was approved 
um, uh, by the US FDA about a year, a little more than a year ago uh, for early stage breast cancer. The other uh, thing that's very interesting is this drug called sasituzumab govotecan. Again, it's another one of these antibody drug conjugates, these magic bullets. And the idea is that this binds to a protein called TROP2, which is on about 96% of triple negative breast cancer. Um, and it also has this cleavable linker, but it has a drug called SN38, um, which is a drug very similar to a drug that we use called Arona TCAN. Um, and so this delivers this directly to the cells. Um, and this just shows you, this is a trial of women who had been through two rounds of chemotherapy for triple negative disease, were randomized to receive uh, Trodelvi, which is sasituzumab govotecan, or standard of care. And just about everybody who got the standard chemo progressed within a couple months. But with sasituzumab, you can see here, it kind of tripled it. So these women, I mean, you know, this is triple negative breast cancer. So women, a lot of them are going to progress, but this really improved it dramatically. It also improved the overall survival dramatically. Um, it doubled it um, from a median of about six months to 12 months or more. Um, and so therefore, everybody gets sasituzumab. Everybody gets Tridelvi now with triple negative breast cancer that's metastatic, either in the second line of therapy after the first line progression or in the third line and beyond. And what's going to happen now, actually, is women likely will get immunotherapy and chemo first line. They'll get Trodelvi second line. And if they have HER2 staining, they'll get in a HER2 third line. That's going to be the new therapy that we're going to do for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, what I don't have, I don't think I have the slides here, but what I do have also is that <laughs> these antibodies are conjugates. We're using them now uh, if people have disease after chemotherapy. So if you have ER uh, estrogen receptor positive, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and you get chemotherapy before surgery and you have residual disease left, we have a trial um, where people get Tridelvi versus standard of care to see if we can improve um, the number of women who don't relapse. We also have another trial if you're HER2 positive and you have residual disease, you're randomized to receive in HER2 uh, versus Cancilla. Um, and these are really good trials that I think will kind of help us um, improve the number of women who never relapse at all uh, and live their lives and never have to worry about their breast cancer again. That's kind of the idea here. So hormonal therapy, and we'll kind of end with hormonal therapy. Um, if you have metastatic breast cancer, um, generally what we'll do is treat you, um, if you're still not menopausal, we'll stop your ovaries uh, with a drug called Zolidex, so we'll take your ovaries out. We'll give you a class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors, drugs called like um, uh, Femara, uh, Arimidex, um, Aromacin. The generic names are Anastrozole, Letrozole, and Exemestane. Or we can give you Tamoxifen. If you progress through that, we'll likely give you uh, Fulvestrin. And sometimes even Megase. I have a few patients. Megase increases your appetite. But this is really old school. When I started an oncology, when I started the Women's Cancer Center 25, 26 years ago, all we really had was Tamoxifen and Megase. Well, aromatase inhibitors were just coming on. We didn't even have Fazolidex. We just had Megase, a drug called Ketoconazole and aromatase inhibitors. We didn't even have those, and tamoxifen. That's all we had. And you know, it was really just, the difference between now and then is just dramatic, it's like night and day. But we've added these drugs called CDK4-6 inhibitors, and these are what are called targeted therapy. Um, you have to have, to go through the cell cycle, um, you have to have the cyclin D and CDK4-6 complex kind of alter this RB protein, and then the cells kind of go through cell the cell cycle. If you inhibit the CDK4-6, you stop the cell cycle, you stop the cells from growing. So they've combined the CDK4-6 inhibitors, Ibrance, Rosenio, and Kisquali with anti-hormonal therapy, and have had really nice dramatic effects. This is a trial called Paloma 2, where women who were postmenopausal, um, who had estrogen receptor positive advanced metastatic breast cancer, um, were randomized to receive letrozole alone, or letrozole and Ibrance. And in this, you can see here, um, the progression-free survival, the amount of time the women lived um, without the cancer getting worse, in this initial result was doubled from 14 to 24 months. This is actually now 28 to 30 months. And so women are doing very, very well. I have women in my practice who are doing well on um, Ibrance, Fresenio, all these other ones for at least four to five years. I have a number of people in my practice that are doing pretty well. Um, and actually this also resulted not only in what we call a progression-free survival advantage, but an overall survival advantage that now with about, uh, you can see here, six years of follow-up, um, <laughs> there still is a survival advantage. Uh, to receiving the CDK4 inhibitor in the first line. So again, this is now the standard of care. Just about everybody will receive a CDK4-6 inhibitor. It really doesn't matter which one you get. They all work about the same. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of pharma marketing floating around right now saying one is better than the other. And, you know, as someone who's done this for a long time, I can tell you that may, one may be different. You never know in oncology. But right now, I think, you know, there's reasons why the trials are a little bit different in overall survival. But 
the bottom line is that all of them work about the same. Um, and this is the ribocyclic showing, you know, a survival advantage here. This is, uh, again, um, really improving over letrozole alone. It's letrozole and ribocyclic. Women living longer with the combination than with letrozole alone. So what, you know, obviously, as medical oncologists, we're doing this very nicely in uh, late-stage breast cancer. What about early-stage breast cancer? Um, and so this is a trial called Monarch E. And these are women um, who had fairly high risk early-stage breast cancer. So they either had more than four lymph nodes involved in their arm or one to three lymph nodes, grade three disease, you know, very poorly differentiated disease or cancers, a tumor size greater than five centimeters, or they had this KI-67, which is a measure of cell proliferation, greater than 20%. And they were given standard chemotherapy and they were given, you know, surgery and radiation therapy. And then they were randomized to receive abemocyclib, which is Verzenio and endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And what they found in this trial is that getting the abemocyclib for two years improved the relapse free survival at three years from 86% to 90%. Again, that's an improvement of about 32% um, in terms, in relative terms. So you have a, like a one third improvement in the, in the disease free survival rate if you got Versenio. But again, I think that we tend to give the Versenio to people who really need it because two years of Versenio can be tough, it can cause diarrhea. Um, it can cause blood clots occasionally. And so, and it's expensive. And so, you know, I tend to use it in people who have stage three breast cancer. Those people who are in my practice know this. That's kind of how I use it. So it was approved actually, um, I believe about a year ago, actually a year ago today, Resenia was approved by the FDA and people have been using it um, now. So, um, I'll end with a few things. I think a lot of people have seen this before. You know, we have all these really cool new treatments, but what about avoiding unnecessary treatment? And, you know, this is a trial I was very involved in, our group was very involved in. Um, Oncotype DX, or the 21 gene assay, uh, is, a, is, 21 pro, is 21 genes that are totaled up into what's called a recurrent score. If the score is over 25, um, you definitely need chemo. If it's under 25, you don't. This is for no negative breast cancer. And if you had a recurrent score, this is like a huge number of women, about 10,000. If they had a low recurrent score, they just got endocrine therapy. If they had a score over 26, they got chemo and endocrine therapy. If they're in between, they were randomized to chemo and endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And not surprisingly, no, let's just go here, not surprisingly that everybody did the same. That if you had a recurrent score under 25, whether you were in menopause or not, you know, you can see here, you know, your eight, your nine year survival was over 90%. Um, the only people who didn't do as well, if you had a higher recurrence score, it went down to about 80%. But that's intrinsically in the cancer, all those women got endocrine therapy and chemo. And so that was really important. So, you know, I think that this is a big deal. And we do this and we do another test called Mammoprint in our practice. I'm not going to show you that data. Um, but then we looked at women uh, with no positive breast cancer. And so these are women now who had a recurrence score greater than 25. If they did, they got chemo and endocrine. These are women with one to three lymph nodes involved. Um, and they, if they had a recurrence score greater than 25, they came on study, zero to 25, they were randomized to chemo and endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And you can see here, um, there was a small but significant difference. It was about a 19% improvement, not huge, um, but about, you know, in absolute terms, about 1.4% to give chemo uh, in the women um, uh, overall. But when we look a little bit deeper, uh, if you were menopausal, uh, postmenopausal, there was no difference to chemo and endocrine therapy if you had a recurrent score under 25. If you're premenopausal, there appeared to be a difference about an absolute difference about 5.2%. So you were getting some benefit, but what a lot of us think, they got that benefit because you're making the premenopausal women menopausal. And a lot of us simply, instead of giving chemo in this setting with a recurrent score less than 20 or a low risk um, mammoprint, we'll just give people, uh, we'll stop their ovaries from working either with a Zolodex or with removing their ovaries and just give them anti-hormonal therapy. Um, so this is kind of what we're, we're doing here and I'll just kind of go through this. So I'll just kind of finish this so we can do that anymore. All right. So last but not least, I've talked about a lot of different things. Um, you know, people always ask, what should I do? Should I stop eating sugar? Should I stop eating high fat foods? I think that the bottom line is that a healthy diet is kind of like the Mediterranean diet. Eat a lot of fruits, eat a lot of vegetables, you know, eat a lot of whole grains, stay away from white stuff like processed bread, processed rice, you know, cheese, kind of try to stay away from all that stuff. I've told people this all the time. And I think that's a healthy diet for everything. Not only heart cancer, but heart disease, bone health, 
you know, I think it's the things docs have always told you. Get out in the sun if you can. Go for a walk, you know, if you can, three or four times a week, at least a mile. I mean, these are the things that docs have been telling people to do for just general health. That right now is what we know will likely help out. Um, and again, this is diet. I mean, basically, if you had a healthy diet, you know, in this huge study of 209,000 women, you theoretically had a 20% decrease in recurrence. But the problem is that there's a lot of confounding variables in these epidemiologic analyses. And it really depends on who studies it, how you study it. You know, I kind of look at all this with a grain of salt, to be honest with you, not to use the pun. But the bottom line is that I don't know. I think just eating a healthy diet is good. Going to McDonald's every day and having a, a going to McDonald's every day and having a quarter pounder with cheese is not probably the goodest thing. The best thing you could do with a, with a regular Coke is, I mean, it's good, it's, it's, it's delicious, but, you know, it just isn't very good for you. Or having a giant pizza every day, you know, with a regular whole wheat, not whole wheat crust. I mean, I think, you know, these are the general health things that you should follow. Um, and again, as I said before, you know, four hours walking a week, you know, maybe a mile three or four times a week is good. You know, and it really improves overall mortality, not just breast cancer mortality. These are the things that docs always tell you. And nothing has changed. You know, there really, unfortunately, is not a magic pill that we have that can avoid some simple changes that people can do in their lives um, to actually make them just be healthier in general. So again, we have a lot of resources um, that people have, I'm sure. You know, um, Jen and, and the Cancer Caring Center have a ton of resources that can help. Obviously, you have me. You have my email. I'm available to just about anybody, as everybody knows. I usually answer my emails pretty quickly if you guys have questions. And even if you're not my patient, you know, I can probably help you out a little bit. I know everybody in the city, you know, and I can kind of probably help you out a little bit if you want to be, if you want to have another opinion or whatever about this. And so I think uh, just to kind of finish this, you know, I've given an enormous amount of information. This is obviously recorded. You can go over it again. And, you know, if you have questions for me about this, just email me. Um, but we have a lot of really cool new drugs is the bottom line, especially these antibody drug conjugates are really neat. The CD4-6 inhibitors are really neat. Um, immunotherapy is getting better and better every year. Uh, and we have ways, I think, to kind of, not only do we have these really cool new therapies, but we also have ways of kind of decreasing the toxicity of whatever therapy you get. And I think that's what's really important here. So with that, I'll kind of end and I will stop the sharing.